I bid you welcome. Hey, Ghost Heads. It's Heidi from Channeling Spirits. It's almost that time of year when stores will be filled with Dracula costumes. The most prevalent image you'll see is a cape, fangs, aristocratic attire, slicked back hair, a medallion, and inhuman skin color. This image of Dracula has become the epitome of vampires in pop culture and is deeply embedded in our collective conscious. But where did it all come from? Bram Stoker's 1897 novel meticulously described the villain, but those characteristics are rarely seen and instead we have an amalgam of attributes from various adaptations. Today we'll be digging deep into the catacombs of Stoker's original description to try and pin down where this image originated. By looking at Dracula's multiple resurrections in theater, film, and other media, we'll be able to pierce into these dressings of the Transylvanian Prince of Darkness. Dracula's history is one part mystery and one part conjecture, as Bram Stoker took detailed notes to ensure incredible accuracy, and yet what inspired the vampire masterpiece is unknown. One of the hottest debates is whether Stoker was aware of the atrocities of Vlad III of Wallachia, also known as Vlad Dracula. The contention to whether Stoker was aware of Vlad's merciless impalements is another topic. However, Stoker finding the name Dracula no doubt caused him to change his original character's name, Count Wampire, and resulted in the original title, The Undead, to be altered as well. But what did Dracula look like? Well, that varies throughout the original novel. As Dracula disguises himself as Jonathan Harker's driver, he is described as a tall man with a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. He wears a great black hat and a brown beard to hide his appearance. When Harker formally meets the Count, he is clean-shaven, save for a long white mustache, and clad in black from head to foot without a single speck of color about him anywhere. Stoker repeatedly describes Dracula's nose as aquiline, meaning hooked, beaky, and with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils. His ears are pale and at the tops extremely pointed. With his broad chin and thin cheeks, he has extraordinary pallor. The backs of his hands are rather white and fine, and hair on the palms with his nails being long and cut to a sharp point. His eyes are blue, but often described as red, or burning especially when angered, which transforms to become positively blazing. The red light in them was lurid, as if the flames of hellfire blazed behind them. After feeding several nights, his youth rejuvenates and Harker finds him half renewed, for the white hair and mustache were changed to dark iron gray. The cheeks were fuller and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever. Later, a zookeeper sees him with a pointed beard with a few white hairs running through it. When Harker escapes to London and sees Dracula again, his beard and mustache are completely black. Bram Stoker went to great lengths to repeatedly describe his creature, and it's important to know with whom he was likely imagining when writing. In 1876, Stoker watched Henry Irving perform in Dublin and wrote an insightful review on the performance. This would go on to blossom into a partnership with Stoker as Irving's personal assistant. He would later go on to fill the role of acting and business manager of the Lyceum Theater. Stoker's reverence for Irving is well documented and many of Dracula's description match Irving in his more diabolical performances, such as Faust's Mephistopheles. Irving had black locks and it is believed that he was 6'2", or 188 centimeters, much taller than the 1870 average of 5'7", or 170 centimeters. 
It has never been verified, but Dracula is described as having a lofty doomed forehead and hair growing scantily round the temples, but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. Despite the possible inspiration, Irving described his viewing of the copyright reading of Dracula in one word, dreadful. Henry Irving would never play the iconic role that may have been based on his own prowess. Having no theatrical works or original illustrations, the first drawing to show Dracula would be a 1901 piece showing a white-haired man with a mustache crawling down the wall of a castle. A pair of bat-like wings seem to overcome him, which is directly from the novel. I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over that dreadful abyss, face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. This is the only mention of a cape or cloak in the novel, but has become a mainstay for the portrayal of Dracula. Despite the detailed descriptions of his physical traits, the only other mention of his attire is that he was well clad in black from head to foot and all in black. A year later, we would get another interpretation, this being a bearded man with a creature of the night. In 1916, another wall crawling image was printed and in 1922, a radically different interpretation would rise. The unauthorized and heavily inspired film, Nosferatu, featured a Dracula analog, Count Orlok. Orlok possesses the most bestial aspect of Stoker's Dracula, with his pointed ears, long claws, and wearing only black. Orlok was the first Dracula-inspired work to depict the creature with pointed teeth, but rather than the fang-like canines we know, he bears long incisors more akin to a rodent. The novel never specifies what teeth are pointed, only that they are white and protrude over his lips. Two years later, the novel would receive an authorized theater adaptation written by Hamilton Dean. Dean made several adjustments from the book, including eliminating a number of secondary characters. Mina and Lucy's roles are switched, and Dr. Seward is now Lucy's father. The largest change is in Dracula, who is already in London when the play begins, and he converses with several characters rather than lurking in the background mysteriously. The play did not have the advantage of the novel, which could subtly convey his royal sophistication juxtaposed with a frightful exterior. Dean knew that a hairy-palmed, unibrowed monster would not work in a Victorian parlor, and he needed his attire to immediately inform the audience of his elegance. The man cast in the role, Raymond Huntley, allegedly provided his own costume, including a large opera cloak, which served as both fashion and function. Dracula could mysteriously disappear through a trap door or a sliding bookcase on set with the aid of his cape. In 1927, a Hungarian immigrant was cast in the titular role when it debuted at the Fulton Theater on Broadway. Bela Lugosi spent several years playing the character, but despite his experience and good reviews, he was not Universal's first choice. It took quite a bit of lobbying and even a pay cut for him to ultimately be selected. The 1931 film became an instant classic whose influence cannot be underestimated. Like his theatrical costume, Lugosi wore his cape and tuxedo, sinisterly slicking back his ebony hair. Interestingly, neither Lugosi nor any of those who played Dracula for Universal Studios ever wore fangs. Another addition to the image of Dracula came with the mysterious medallion. The intent was to evoke the formal evening attire seen in the 1900s. The prop itself has been lost, as have records of it. The sunburst, crescents, and stars were common accents in Islamic medals during the late 19th and early 20th century. 
Such metals would have been common and rather cheap after the fall of the Ottoman Empire and Kingdom of Afghanistan. With the films being in black and white, it is hard to say how pale Dracula's skin actually was. Count Orlok's high contrast does seem to depict a lighter tone, while Bela Lugosi's betrayal seems to match the tones of those on screen with him. Most posters do not show Lugosi with an unusual color, nor do black and white photos that have been colorized. However, that began to shift in the 1950s. With the age of the atomic monster, gothic horror was on the decline. Hammer Film Productions began a new, more graphic series in 1958 with a much paler Dracula. Around the same time, the American monster craze revealed a lighter side to the terrors of the past. Famous monsters of filmland featured colorful colors, often giving Dracula an eerie shade of blue. This wasn't the first time the Count had been printed in blue, and in 1966, the black and white monsters came alive in color in Monster Go Home. Here, Grandpa Munster is shown in his now famous hue of blue, which has also seeped into the popular images of Dracula. Even the 1979 Salem's Lot miniseries showed Kurt Barlow in this colorful skin tone. These decisions to make vampires cartoonish colors likely stemmed from the invention of Technicolor and the desire to remove human elements from such monsters. You can still commonly see comic depictions of Dracula in his blue tints and occasionally green, though this color is usually reserved for Frankenstein's monster. Modern adaptations vary from being extremely pale to something ruddier. Francis Ford Coppola opted for both in his 1992 film, Bram Stoker's Dracula. He attempted to tie the historic Vlad Dracula with the fictional and create a work closer to the original novel than previous films have been. Ultimately, the appearance is closer to Stoker's novel, but bears more resemblance to Vlad III. And whatever this is supposed to be. Can you explain that? Can you explain that? I can't explain that. I can't explain that. No one can explain that! Pop culture has cemented in our minds the cape-wearing aristocrat, with his unusual skin, fangs, medallion, and greased back hair. When in actuality, Bram Stoker intended him to look a lot more like this. But just as his appearance transformed many times throughout the novel, so has it throughout history. Who knows what new work may yet shape the face of Dracula. If you enjoyed this video and think we deserve it, 10 out of 10! Yeah, I still got it. Please subscribe. I'm Heidi with Channeling Spirits, and thanks for watching.